We had 12 chat rooms running simultaneously, with delegates able to visit any five of their choice. 20 to 30 minute sessions plus Q&A. Given it's an interactive session, the audio is sometimes affected, so apologies in advance. I remember my mum taking me for bushwalks in Karingai Chase when I'm about seven, seven eight, eight or nine and liking the names Baronia, Eri Osterman and the Spider Flower, the Grevilleas. And then in 15, Dad built a dark room under the house and he taught me how to process black and white negatives and print black and white photos. Then I had two friends when I was 17 who were both photographers and filmmakers and they were huge influences all my life and we influenced each other. So Mum had no chance of getting me back out into the bush. But around the year 2000, I started to work on a couple of garden and landscaping magazines. And that was interesting. So they're mostly advertorials and a lot of it was for for landscapers. But some some was pure pure botanical work. And then in 2005, I did my first personal photography. But it wasn't with plants or shrubs. I got this phone call from a well-known Sydney designer, writer, interesting person who's now passed away. And he said, Bruce, I want to do a book with you. I said, what is it, Ross? And he said, that's the Angophora tree. And you'll have 200 hours photography and I'll have 20 hours writing. And sadly, Ross passed away with dementia at a very early age. But I have a, a body of work of the Angophora tree. So that's me. Now, who can see, who can see creatively here? who can't see creatively. (laughs) That's okay. Who's made photo books before? Good, one, two, three or four. Who knows what depth of field is? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good one. Okay, we'll pass on that one then, for the time then. All right. Now, I'm gonna pass around some- There's There's a difference between what you see in your head and being able to make it come out in a, a shot. Yeah. That's what you're for. Tell us how to do that. <laughs> Within okay, five minutes. Because we're all, we're all different though. We all have different, different journeys you want to tap. Yes. That's why I put you here. You see, you, you get the first. This shot, here, give me just wait for a minute. This is just a very simple shot, but the background's out of focus. Because mm-hmm. if the background was in focus, you wouldn't be looking at the flower. No. But I've still got it in there because it tells a bit of a story. Do you want to pass, pass around when you're finished? There's these next two shots we're taking on a trip out to the Central West. They're at, that's a, a Mallee fruit at, a, an, at, at an Abori Mountain near Wellington in the Central West New South Wales. Yeah, yeah that's the one. <laughs> Again, they're just taken with nothing special. Well, it's taken with a telephoto lens. It's not taken with a macro lens. And, and here's another one as well. Do you want to pass that one around? How would the macro lens go if? Sorry? How would the macro lens go if you took the sun? Well, it depends like what you're after, you know, but you've got to work out, you might have wanted to get this, you know what I mean? But I wanted it. Yeah, but how would the photo look differently if you use a macro lens? Uh, the macro lens allows you to come in closer and be in focus. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've, I've got a macro lens, I'm only going to show one photo of it, but I, haven't, I don't use it really as a macro. In some ways, I do. Now I want to show a series of photos I've taken up at a property two, hundred, two hours north of Sydney. Okay, move me from there. This is the photo taken with a 12 millimeter lens. That's all in focus. This image, this is gone, this is burnt out. This is what I'm saying, it's one thing, one, one simple reason why you can take great photos, because it might not be there next week. The Gosler's Mountain Fire took that out. And I had trouble finding where, where it was, except for there's a little rock down here somewhere on this little rock, on that rock. Eventually I found it and that's where it was. So that's that one. Now I don't often use a 12 millimeter lens to do it, but that was so, that little area was so unique. It was like out of a fantasy, fantasy film. And so you can pass this. This is more more moody. You can pass that one round. The 12 millimeter lens is to give you a width of field. Yeah. Yeah. 
it gets this sort of thing. And I use that for a lot of architectural photography and doing a lot of commercial work with for landscapers where I want to get this, yeah. whereas a 50 millimeter lens will let me to have this, but pulls it in, and a, a telephoto lens will, will give me this, but it will com compact your compact it all. And, and the distortion on the outer perimeter of the, the photo is with a 12 millimeter. Not well, usually the, on the very edges it can be a bit radical, but you can pull on the computer. I can pull it up. I can straighten it up a bit or whatever. But most of those are not. Now, this next photo, I'm lying down. I'm in, I'm in the muck, but as a photographer, I found something which had the light in the background on the burnt out area. But I've got the new growth. But I've also liked it too. I've only got two colours in the photo, other than the neutrals. And I've got all this. So that's with my 200mm lens, and that's lying down. And that's about three or four months after the fire went through. The fire went through the property. My partner was lying in bed at night. She looked at the app and said, oh, the fire's just gone through. What am I? Because we were very lucky the fire didn't go through while and why. She phoned up, she emailed a, a neighbour in the morning and said, no, your house was rescued. There's a few guys up there, they're called the Black Ops, and they had water tankers, 1,000 gallon tanks. They didn't hose it down, but they actually pulled our pipes, our big water pipes, out of the way. We were lucky the fire came through at night and it dribbled around the, the little shack, and it dribbled around that, and then up the hill a bit. But on the southwestern side of the property, it came roaring through and took out a few other funny little properties. And this is one of my favourite shots. This is what I love to try to do. This is after the fire, but I've got the outer focus background telling the story just as much, just as interesting as the foreground photo. And that's with a 200mm lens. I, I use that well, 70 to 200 on my camera. I, that's the main lens that I use. So when you, when you take a photograph like that, are you condensing it down after you've taken it to, or is that the shot complete? That's pretty much, I, don't, I might have, that's, that's virtually, Tripped it a bit, that's full frame. A that's virtually full frame, okay, that one. Okay. I try to get it in full frame, but often I'm, sometimes like commercial, you've got, you've got to get something in it, then you'll just crop it out later. Yes. Back in the old days with the darkroom printing where you'd work out what you wanted to print. And what are you using most of the time? Um, I just got a Nikon, Nikon, Nikon stuff. My camera, my camera body's worth about two thousand mm dollars, -hmm. and I've got. I um, often use a all my my seventy to two hundred lens. I bought second hand for thousand dollars about six years ago. I've got a second hand fifty millimeter one point four lens. If that means anything to you, but it means I can shoot amazing shallow depth of fields. I can take a portrait of you with my fifty, and. From behind your ear, everything's out of focus, which is great for all sorts of things. And this is the, the Xantharias. After the fire, they came back with often four to a plant. It was just amazing. And this is an area where the lyrebird used to do its dances. And it was amazing. You know, the lion, we've got two lyrebirds on either side of the property. Can you shoot? Some of these shots at specific times of day. Oh, yes, yeah, that's the most important thing. I'm going to tell you, I usually, I'll get, if it's misty, I love, it, I love it when it's misty, I'll sit outside and have a coffee. And all of a sudden, it's light enough to take photos. I start to just go, well, I'll walk off. I have a, one area that I'll go to. And I took this photo. I was walking up an area from where I often like to go. And I had the camera pointing north. And I turned around to the south and I saw this. And I, I could not believe what I'm looking at. I almost had to blink. I had never seen that before in my whole life. But the weird thing was, down to the southwest was all blue sky. And it's front lit with mist. In other words, at the background, it's blue sky. And, and I'm looking down about 10 or 12 kilometres for that blue in the background. But the front, there's a strong mist but it's strong enough and it's warm and it's warming up the trunk of that agrofera. And it's just, just amazing. And I did a few shots, a few different ones, and I walked up the track and when I came back, didn't even see, you couldn't see it. The light was off and it disappeared. So it's a magic show. That's, so when you're taking photos, in the, even in the garden, there's certain times of the day you're gonna get amazing photos.
doesn't matter what time of the, the, that morning or afternoon, you'll get great shots and other times you won't. And that's when you have to take your photos. Well, that's when you should take your photos. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one up at Wallenby too. This is a very hard area to take photos. Normally in the background of this photo, there's a lot of stuff happening. And it distracts from this another beautiful uh, gophra. But I'm lucky, I, I ran down about 10 o'clock one morning before I, I left and come back to Sydney and, and, and shot this. But it was hard for me in the problem. That's not a fantastic photo as such, but... Now the next photo I'm going to show you is a photo I like to have it blown up to two metres wide. It's, it's almost abstract, but it's not. It, it just, so to me, it just reeks of the whole area. You, can, you won't see it from here, I'll pass it around, and if you can imagine it, that on a wall, frame two metres high. Just the detail in here, and the fact that it has this brown and green, the colours, I just love that. I mean, I've, I've been photographing this area for 10 years, all the time, all over the place, but now I'm going to make a little movie of it. Yeah, yeah, my friend. Mm. So what, what area is it? For it's Wollombi. Wollombi is 20 kilometres south of Cessnock, but it's in the hills. Uh, where are you from? Oh, you're from South Australia, eh? No, I'm from okay. Canberra. Canberra, okay. I asked them. Yeah. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> now, no, Wollongbye is like, it's yeah, inland. You know, you, well, yeah. from Wyalum, you have the Wattigan Hill yeah. Range. Yeah. It's another two, from the Wattigans, it's another two hills inland. Yeah. So it's quite yeah. interesting. Often it's in a, it's in a wind shut rain and wind shadow yeah. area. Often there's no wind. It's quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now these are a couple of books I've made on my partner's garden, which I, we do at say 60-40, she's 60% on 40%. And here's some nice ones that I'll pass, you can pick this up and pass them. In this one here, this is the beginning of, beginning of a front garden where we had almost a, a Japanese style sandstones. And in the other garden, three or four years later, you'll, you'll, that was the beginning, but in here, I just want to show you to me, this is some great examples in a small garden of depth of field. I mean, I mean most people might know what that is and what that is, that's kangaroo paw, but anybody know what this is? I mean, if you have the garden, you just know, but you know. So, and there's another one in here which is a bit more poetic, but it's still, it's across two pages. Now, I don't know what lens this was, but my, I, quite, I like that because it's different. Cause to me, it's like it's like a fantasy of walking into the garden. But it only works well on the hook. You, you're not going to look at it on, on a phone yeah. or a photo. But mm -hmm. when you can open it, and it's all the book's all about turning the pages. What's on the next page? What's on the previous page? So that's the back look in, in the garden. That that hedge is now gone, and we have a sandstone fence about this height. And everybody walks in and wants to know what's that plant in the garden. What's that? And I drag into this garden. Some burnt out logs from Wallumbi, small logs which were hollow, I put them in three or four parts of this garden and then the skinks lived there. As soon as the sun comes out, the skinks are in them. You see the photos in that book. But also the fact of getting rid of that hedge and putting the sandstone fence, everyone just hovers in the garden and when they go past. But, that, but I love this, this is for me, you know, when you're doing a body of work where you've got 80 photos in a book, you can do anything you want to. <laughs> you don't need to have the set up photos, this is the garden. Whereas, this is one I did last spring. That's the size of the garden, the front garden that I was showing you. It's, like, it's, it's tiny, but you just don't need much to, to go and get great photos. You can have a look at that and Here are the skinks on the hollow logs. In oh, the I'm loving it. Very happy. <laughs> but that's now. Going so wild, like. I think rain's a big thing too. Taking photos in the rain. When I find them. Now here's another story on patience. 
This is up in the Ram's Head Range, above, above and to the south of Trebo. There's an amazing group of snow gums up there. And I found this group that was huge. There, there might have been 10 or so roots growing out of the ground. But it, was a, it took me about 20 minutes to find a, a shape that I thought would fit on a page all right. It was so hard. But I, I quite love that. It just shows that the age of these trees. It's just, about, it's just mm -hmm. quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to try and find those rain photos for now. That's patience, you know. We, we want to, I photographed the snow gum quite a few years earlier. Oh, here we are, here's the rain. Now this tree here was, I wanted to get rain for the book because this is a beautiful, this is up at West Head for anybody who's doing the, the trip around Sydney next week. It's one of the north, northernmost parts of Sydney. But now I came back to try and find that tree four months later. I couldn't find it because it's depending on the lens you're looking through, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, I, I could work out what lens I was looking at, I, I used for the camera, for the, for the photo, but honestly, it's weird. So I've been back another time, I still can't find it. So I wanted to see what it looked like. And that's the trunk of an Angophora in the rain. So just, get, just getting out and taking photos in the rain, even if it's your home, or wait till it stops raining, cause, or you want soft light. Soft light is the most beautiful thing you need for photos. So has anybody got any questions? Is there any questions? Well, I'll, I'll have the last one. I might ask a question or a wall. You can't locate that tree that you're looking for. Does your camera record your GPS setting? No, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do that. No, no, I could. Some of them do, but I, I, haven't, look, I haven't set mine up for that. But I could, you know, yeah. No, I was just curious to know, but a lot of the trees are on, but hang on. One of the ones here. There's a tree I have in here. I went back to looking for this. I took this in about 2006. Went back now, it's about 60 feet high. I think this is my favourite tree in, in the book, this one here. This Angophora here, looking on the Challenger track, looking across to the Hawkesbury River. Now, I just, often I go out, I know the light, I've got the equipment and the, and the light's right, but I never know what I'm going to find when I was doing this. But that tree now, it's way up there, so it's not a photo. <laughs> All those photos are gone. So if anything is shot in 2006, it's not photogenic. It's way up there, you know? Do you always use a tripod? Sorry? Do you always use a tripod? Look, I use a lot of a tripod for shooting the Agrofra tree because I didn't want to get a lot of it all in focus. But now I don't. And also my camera body, now I can shoot at 1,000 ISO or, ISO, or even 1,600. But if I was, yeah, so no, to answer your question, predominantly I don't, I've got a tripod in the car. Often I don't even do commercial jobs, but I did some commercial jobs last week. I had these beautiful parks, tiny little boutique parks in Sydney. But they're all mostly photo from the 12 millimeter lens and a tripod. But if anyone wants to have a look at, look at these and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, your approach is to, your photographs strike me as being very artistic. Well, it is, absolutely. Yes, it's not sort of a sort of a See, I flunked Latin in third year, you see. I told you, well, that was a clue. I'm not going to be a botanical person. I'm still not, I'm still very irreverent. I hate, you know, my partner's the opposite. She's a maths teacher. She was having a massive watch science degree, you know. So, but you're definitely looking, I get the impression you are looking to create an image that you have a quite definite idea in your mind as to what No, I just go and take it, but I'll, I want to make it look like it's what it is. Yes. I'm not, they're, they're, it's they're, like they're not meant to be botanical specimens and no, put in a jar by no, Charles Darwin. No, they, they create yeah. all sorts of different reactions mm. um, to, the, to the viewer, I think. Is the okay. Angophora your favourite tree to photograph? Well, it was for me. I just loved it because it's very huge. The arms are like this. It's just, it's just amazing, you know. The colour in the trunk. Yeah, especially around Christmas time when, it, when, the, when the, the old, old bark drops off and you have this red bark. It's really beautiful. Do you ever use a phone to take a photograph? I do. I actually used the phone. I put one up on Instagram recently because I was going to see my eye doctor 
And I was walking up Martin Place and there was a shaft of light coming down. I pulled my phone out. And, oh, thank God for the phone. You know? But look, now, look, I used the phone up more for a record tool. When I could, if I only had a phone, I think I would mentally get my, my head in the space that I, I felt I had to use the phone. It, it would be, I'll, be friend, I'll be friendly with it, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I like not to use as much technology as I don't need to, you know what I mean? I only use Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom, I don't use anything else. And I shoot all my photos in RAW. And that means what, what you see in the back of the camera can, can look pretty, pretty normal, nothing mm -hmm. special. Because what it is when you shoot in RAW, you're shooting in a file which hasn't, the camera hasn't done all the selecting for you and given you a JPEG and they, they knock out half the, in, not half the information, a good fifth of the information gets knocked out. When you, when, 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 if you just shoot in JPEGs, that, that for a lot of people that's not a big thing. But I like to shoot in RAW and then I can then come back and reconstruct how I saw the photo or, ha or what I want. Although saying that most of my colouring in the images is not, not nothing. The big thing is like, when I'm shooting and going, I might want to put detail in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the highlights there, or in the light in the shadow. There's too many colours. Not on this one. Uh, who's got too many colours on here? I might want to take some of the blue out of this jacket here. Or, or, the, or the jeep, this black thing, you reduce the black a bit. It's too black so I can see just a little bit more detail on some. Do you use Instagram much? All the time. Because I, I guess yesterday I was looking at someone who lives up near Mount Kira mm -hmm. on, a, on a huge five or six acre block and forgotten her Instagram name and she put up a whole lot of things which were being mentioned in that room over there. I like, like them. And she had paragraphs and paragraphs of information and her photos were just amazing. Mm -hmm. So she's at Mount Kira and that's, I saw that yesterday. Wow. So I, visited, I went up and visited a photographer at Bulleye yesterday. Spend time with him. Any more? Any, any interesting? Raw it is. Um, it, it, it brings you everything, and it's then up to you if you want to modify. JPEG does some modification. Well, it, it does to a degree. Look, at, they're all very subliminal. It's very subtle. A lot of eyes wouldn't pick it up because I remember my first giving some of my client commercial clients raw files. They looked horrible. But you had to work on them, you know, you've got to work on them. What I'm finding with a lot of my plant stuff, I take the contrast back, take it back, and soften, soften, soften. You can just put your images onto the computer, the basic software, you can just tweak it. You might want to take, you might, I want to take the colour back a bit. I often reduce colours more than the times. I, I take certain colours out of photos. Who can I pick on here? The colour. <laughs> Uh, no, no, there's not a lot of mixed colours other than me. Uh, no, but often I'll take, in some of the, the, the landscape shots, the yellow is so dominant. You take the yellow out and the photo comes back to life again. Because the yellow's just taken over in the late afternoons. And you can do that. If you, if you do it, are interested, you can get Photoshop for $12 a month if you are taking lots of photos. But even on your phone, I think there's some software that you can do it. And they're amateurs, but they've got a good photo. And like it, that would be beautiful with a bit of software adjustment. Mm, Look, an iPhone is like using an old hammer. To me, I've got a, like a hammer gun, and you've got a hammer. It doesn't mean that if you have a, an iPhone, you can't take brilliant photos. A lot of people make movies with iPhones, you know? Mm -hmm. and a, lot, a lot of photographers, I had one of my friends who was back in Brazil for a long time recently. He said he got to all his work was on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm just so challenged. I find you don't have a depth of field. No, no, but you have to work. Yeah, you forget that. You, you do what you can do. <laughs> you work with what you can do. So the charms there is with pixel long distance, like if you use long distance. Yeah, they must just have to give this If you're tiny and larger, yes, you'll get pixelated than that. But no, no, but the actual composition, which part of that panorama um, to choose. Oh, that's so, your choice. Yeah, yeah. So, so do you have sort of composition? Well, I think the most important thing is learning to see. More than anything is learning to see. And look at, look at ads. Look how they're done. Look at quality ads. Look, let's look at ads in papers. Look at editorial photos, which used to be in the Sydney Morning Herald, which are all gone now. You know what I mean? Look at any good book. Let's look at composition. It's, it's hard. I can't just 
I can say furs, you know, and all that sort of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, you'll, you'll start to you'll sense what you want to see in a photo. If you walk out in the bush and or anywhere in the late afternoon in beautiful light, you'll sense something. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Your eye will tell you, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. But then you might find there's a few things, extra things you might put in, but then you might crop into it and say, oh, that's where the photo was. But I, I often get that. I know, yeah, I've shot this. This is where the action is. And Bruce, have you ever done much with birds? Uh, look, I have. Birds. Oh, look, I have, but then, and I've only got a 200 mil lens. Look, you really need $12,000, a 500 mil. Look, the night that Trump got inaugurated, my partner and I were staying at O'Reilly's guest house. And in the morning, was a group of Americans there. Most of their, their camera gear wasn't, was average price $20,000 worth of gear for each person. They had lenses for birds, you know what I mean? To, you know, 600 mil lenses. Mm. And that's, if you want to do birds, you have to, that's the most expensive hobby of anyone, birds. I mean, a 200 mil lens, if I'm lucky, a Palm Beach, I can get birds close up, you know what I mean? But, you know, I can get sea eagles, but if I have, you know, and, and other ones, and a lot of keats. But you've got to be arsy, if you're in a very area where was, which is wooded and the birds get to know you, you'll get them. Or, but you can, you can get cheap lenses. I had a friend I was asking his what his lens and he had forgotten a lens that was a 150 to 500. But it was a much, it was a B lens, but he might have paid, I don't know, $1,500 for it, might have been a thousand, I don't know. But often when you're looking on a phone or something or, or on, it, on social media, you can't tell the quality of, of the lens. But, when you, but I like to do prints and I like to do books. Do you use filters? Never. Never. I can remember one of the magazines used one of my photos. I had a, had a, a, a street sign, I, I had a road sign with Ayers Rock behind it, and it was in, in his magazine as an example of, of using a polarising filter. It wasn't, it was Fuji film. Because <laughs> that's, the, that's the result that a, a polarizer might have given you. No. I think I have a 50mm lens, I bought it second hand, and it's, it's got a filter on it, but I, I, I filtered nothing. It's, it's really, I'm just after what I'm, I don't know, I'm after essence. I'm not, I'm not a technical photographer, you know? I don't know if I had a client who wanted to pay me to do something technical, I think I'd possibly accept to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm lucky, yeah, I've got two magazines that I work for, and they're both different, and they allow, they allow me to write what I'm for them. Yes. And I do all sorts of things. And I have a huge landscaping client which does everything from national parks, they deal with national, help, national parks, and I've done about so much work for the city, city council, with all these little boutique parks in Sydney, which are not much bigger than this room, and I have to go and photograph them for them, and it's quite a challenge, it's great, I love that. Yeah. And it's all about the light. Yeah, well, the big landscapes are hard because there's so much in them, and you know, you can't work out which is the focal point sometimes. But you've got to work it out. Look, look, it might be a shaft of light hitting a tree or something, do you know what I mean? And what's your, what is your eye drawn to? And that's a, we're all drawn to different things in a photo. Can I ask a very, very basic question? Of course you can. I use an automatic camera. Sorry? I use an automatic camera. That's okay. But what's the best time of day? Go in the middle of the day to flowers. Look, up, look after four o'clock and, and oh. before nine o'clock. You know, that's, look, I don't know. Excuse me, Bruce. Five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, look, it's just the worst thing with the camera. All massively, look, after four, before nine, anything like that. But if it's raining and overcast, but you've got beautiful photos in rain, and when it's soft overcast, if you can bring your contrast up a little bit, you'll get beautiful, because flat overcast means on my front garden at Cremorne, this can be in shadow, this can be warm, you know what I mean? You've got the, once it rains, and, and you have, everything's the same lighting value. In one of the books there, Three. it's the front garden in the rain. I think it, or is it this one? It might be the other one. See this one, this is the front garden up there. All these, all the photography in here is taken in this, here. But that's taken in the rain. This is not good printing particularly, but this was, the rain was fantastic and allowed me to get that shot. I think there's another one in here. This is another one here in the rain. 
but it, it's that, that that allows me to capture the whole thing. But other than hot, hot spots and shadows and, and stuff in it. So Thank you, mate. Do you make these books yourself, Bruce, or M Mr. Blurb helped me with those? Mr. Blurb. Mr. Blurb. B L U R B. That's an Mr. American Blurb. American okay. company does books. Okay. But you can use Memento. There's a whole lot of them. Mate. Someone okay. said even what's the uh, Hobbes Blurb. works does books. Okay. You have your level, you know. They're quite good, aren't they? They're I mean, you can look. You can spend you can spend ten or hours or twenty yeah. hours designing your book. Once you get the software, you work out. I want to pop this photo. Or this page could be all look left to right. So that's a hero page. Then you want to work out what you want to put on the other page, and half the fun is working out mm. what images you want yeah. to put on the pages. And that's great. And that book would have cost possibly around a hundred dollars for that one. Mm. Um, I made that up pretty quickly. Is it? As a present for my partner. Mm -hmm. I was waiting around trying to get the photos before they, when they first came out. Yet my commercial book for a thousand copies is twenty-six thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Bruce, um, do you have to ask people permission no. to include their photo? Look, if I was in Paris, I learned in Paris if I put people. At in a situation, yeah. you needed to officially get their permission. But now my partner's said that no one's even contacted me yet and said, I'm in the book, can I get a copy of the print or something? <laughs> there was no one. But only one person ever asked me and said, did, did you take my photo? Yeah. Sorry guys, this is about strip photography. Mm -hmm. And I said yes, and she said, can you delete it? And I said, yes, of course. Okay. And that's it, that's it. No, no, no one, a lot of the times I've used a long lens from a distance. Yeah. So who has the best makeup on that photo, him or her? <laughs> good eye, good eye. No, look, really, uh, a, lot, a lot of the times I've used a manual lens and I'll put it on five feet and I've walked around past people like they're here, here and I'll walk down and I go, oh. and I'll hold the camera down here and, I'd set, and I'll set the focus on five feet or four feet and I've relied on depth of field to get the focus that I want. Yeah. I've, done a, I've done a lighting test and quite a few photos there I've walked past like that. And I spent four or five years going into the city to do that. Mm -hmm. And the original photos were taken at a May Day rally at Newcastle in 74, and that's what got me intrigued. But anyway, that's another thing. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.